Thanks. Uh, welcome, uh, Jeff, to the third part. Thank you. It's a much more coarse-growing wisteria. 
has shorter bunches, bigger flowers, and they've got a velvety texture, the very highly standard. So it is also excellent. In some climate, it's um, a flowering about three weeks earlier or a couple of weeks earlier than these others. In our climate, it tends to flower about two or three weeks later for some reason. Maybe it's the lack of cool winter, doesn't trigger it off. Okay, now, worst on the list in my opinion is the wisteria flower bundles for this climate. They are the Japanese wisterias. They grow like the clappers and put leaves out everywhere and then every year you're waiting for the flowers to come. If after about 10 years, especially if they're in the ground, after about 10 years, suddenly you'll be surprised with, um, even where I am, where we, where we get a little bit of white frost sometimes. Um, we've got a couple out in the ground, but the flowering is pathetic. You get all the leaves come out at the same time virtually, and you get, you know, even in a big vine, you might get 10 flower heads, that's it. Compared to these, we just get 10 on every bunch, on every, on every twig. Unfortunately, that is the case with floral bundles because they're the ones that you mainly see on the internet as uh, wisteria bonsai. There's so many cultivars of that, not only in colours, but there's a double one called. Um, Flying dragon or double purple dragon or something which has double flowers all the way down. And then there's another particularly attractive uh, cultivar called the long longissima cultivars where the flower racemes can be in the to the or four foot long or four foot long. And they're absolutely beautiful, but they do not they do not flower. They do well, but they don't flower very well. Okay, last on the list here, oh, there was two more. Last on the list, um, are the American wisterias. Now, I don't know if anyone's seen these. They've never been available in this area. I've only seen them in the last five years. I think about my bunnings and that. It's wisteria frutescens, which goes to situas but doesn't flower until after all the leaves are out and all the extensions are happening and then it flowers on the end of all the young branches. Now, for bonsai, they're probably a good choice because um, there's a couple of pictures up here I'll show you in a minute. The bonsai is probably a good choice because the flower racemes are quite short. There's one uh, cultivar that's even shorter called um, Amethyst Falls. Uh, but it's got the unfortunate thing to me is that it smells like cat's poo. <laughs> <laughs> it may not smell like that to you. It's only because um, I'm on recording here that I see poo in here. So, <clears throat> so it's okay as well, uh, but it gives you the flowers during the summer, late spring and summer when it's in full um, Right. If you want to put up some of those pictures there for a second, I'll just go through that quickly. Oh, that's, okay. uh, that's just this one a couple of years ago that we showed, and it's a little bit more out. It's uh, yeah, a bit dark there. Uh, okay, next. All my white ones here, incidentally, are all. <coughs> that one and that one and there's several at home. I got to a situation where I had too many purples and I kept all the best purples as purples and I decided to um, get the... Is that make a difference? Not really. I decided to um, graft some of the white that I knew was a good flower because I only had a nursery plant with skin and things on it. So I decided to graft some of the white ones onto old purple trunks. So this one here has been grafted there and there, and the one over there has been grafted near the top as well. So that, that down there is a wisteria purple. If you've got shoots coming out the bottom there, they'd be purple. So that's just been grafted on the purple, just to get the old gnarled uh, trunk. So I've done that several times. Oh, that's another one we've got at home where the top part of that one now, oh, if I leave through it, um, the top part of that has been taken off there. And the branches are now coming out more towards that side. I'm allowing a little one to grow up there, just a little bit of an apex. But I want to do uh, with that one, because it's, well, it's in a bit of pop there too, you can read I want to do with that one, which I've done about there, and I'm going to read the side and allow the branches to really hang and have brand, uh, flowers all around the branches. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the next one? Okay. That's it again. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's just what it's 
sabi niya na nalang mo ito. Next. That one, now I'll get on this in a minute. That one is done from just an aerial liar. Who's familiar with what an aerial liar is? Um, done from an aerial liar uh, only two years ago. Now, the big problem with that is, which I didn't realize at the time, when you do an aerial liar from a plant that has um, been growing in the shade, the way your trunk has been growing in the shade, and you get roots on it, that's fine. Get it out, and of course the first thing I'll do is put it straight out in the sun to get it growing vigorously, vigorously. Which theory that even though it's a tough plant, if those trunks are exposed to too much heat and sunshine, the whole side of that is exposed to the sunshine, you don't know at first, has all over here to die. And um, only the back parts that work in the sun have stayed alive and are taking you know, nutrients up to the branches. So we've got this dreadful reverse paper thing there with that, which is unfortunate. So this year what I'm going to do as soon as it's, this is going to take a long time to yeah. What I'm going to do there is put another layer on there to get roots coming out of here. It'll be a short tree, but I won't do that with the reverse paper thing that thing. Um, with the hollowed out trunk and that, you know, it should look okay eventually. But that's only from the layer of the layer that I was two years ago. So you don't have to wait for three to just put a little thing to pick up the one out. Next. Next. That's the same thing on the other side. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. um, that stands about that high. Mm -hmm. So that's the only Japanese one that I have that is at the bonsai. It's just in bud at the moment and it's too big to be on the car. It's a Floribunda carnea, which is, comes out all the buds are uh, quite a nice pink. And the flowers open at the top, they're pinkish. And, oh, sorry, at the top they open white and then all the buds are pink all the way down until they open fully. Again, it's a Japanese, so it's... Um, uh, when I bought that at the nursery in the wool bar, I had it for something like 12 years before it came out as a So that's how unreliable they are. But now that it's there, it's, it's not a thing. It's far too big, so this year I'm going to have to really severely cut that right back right to here and get new, new vigorous growths coming out and get it more compact so that, you know, what's the point of only having it at home when you can't show anyway? <laughs> uh, okay, next. <coughs> uh, it's coming in bunch this year. It looks like the best it's ever been. Are you coming back to bunch or will it look like bud on the wall of wood? Of course, I'll get on that in a minute, but wisteria will bud. If you have a wisteria vine in the ground and you cut it off at the ground, it will bud. It will shoot everywhere. It will even shoot from root cutting. <laughs> as you know, that's what it is. Uh, that was taken from the internet, just I'd say it's um, uh, synthesis purple. <coughs> what are the types that have the short flowers? Well, it's this, same as this. The ones with the really short flowers are the American ones. You know, this smells like cat food. Next, we just took a few off the internet last yeah. night. I like that because it was against the old background. Mm -hmm. and that's obviously been an old vine that's been taken out of the ground and I'll cover all that and propagation and the rest of it. That one I quite like the uh, shape of as well. A lot of these ones here are growing in reasonably shallow pots, which I, if I did, I would find a total disaster in this climate. They just dry out too quickly. And if you grow them in a um, uh, too shallow pot, you've always got to sit in your water, which I'll get on with it. Sit in the water and the pot gets destroyed. That's the uh, flora bundle on I couldn't tell you which particular cultivar, but they're the ones that I said that were really long flower racines that you know, can get up to a little or more long. I think they've crammed it in that table a little bit, but that's uh, quite impressive. You can see the flower and the leaves are starting at the same time. The beauty with the, the Chinese ones is they usually flower first and then at the end of flowering, they will start with the leaves. Because the Japanese tend to get the same time. That would be another synthesis purple. But I have a good picture of that one because of the green pot, which you can't see. But right. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm just such a pop choice of this. Next. Well, that's that one again. Oh, we did do two of that, too. I thought we had. And next. Um, that one there, I have no idea why I put it there. Oh, yeah, that's kind of there. That's the flower by the car there that comes out. That's a small pink than that. It's not as lavender purple as that. With a little yellow centre. So that's that big one that I was uh, showing you earlier. 
That is the American wisteria um, producing uh, Anarchist Falls, whatever it's called. Yeah, Anarchist Falls. So you see, it's got all the leaves and it gets little bunches of wisteria all over. So if you can find those in the nurseries, they're worth, worth doing, but they're skinny little trunks. And I'm even tried drafting that onto the old um, trunks of this wisteria that as yet has not been successful and uh, haven't taken. Now that one, the one I didn't mention earlier, you'll see um, in some bonsai like catalogs there's a thing called miniature wisteria. That whole plant there is about that high. So the leaves are only that big. Um, it's actually a Nelepia, which uh, is closely related to wisteria. Our native Australian wisteria, the really big growing one, is a Nelepia as well. Nelepia megastone, you can see. So this is a Nelepia. He has it, the few other ones I know she's taken off. Don't ever expect it to flower. It was a blind wisteria, they call it, or a blind Olivia. And it's such a cold bar, it's so tight and compact, it just doesn't get flowers. I've even grafted that years ago, grafted onto the Chinese purple, expecting vigorous growth, lasted six months and got there. So, is there any more? That one there I took a picture of because it only has it, it's got a lovely tree there, but I don't wish they'd do something with it. We think we'll do all that <laughs> and sort of keep it more compact and manageable. Nice thick trunk and everything. I think it looks much better than the most of this. It looks like it's about to climb out of someone's house. You know? <laughs> uh, that is the Wisteria Brachybotrys Shiro Capitan. <laughs> now, Brachybotrys Wisterias, as far as I know, it's only the white one that is commonly available. Um, in the book that I've got there, apparently in Australia there are a lot of other cultivars that would be worthwhile trying in this climate. So far, that's the only one I've got. I do have one bonsai I've had at home, but it's, it's, it's further along as a um, skinny little thing, so I'm going to bond to it. Now, that again is the um, American one. That's the, the ordinary fruit of seeds, and the other one, um, Amethyst Falls have a shorter, more compact, almost a ball-like bunch of flowers. <coughs> it's like a little purple ball. So that's the American one again, flowering wild and leaf. That's it. Put it on the for a while. Nah, that's not far. Okay, that's all the varieties. What time does that one stop the dark in the day? 2.30. 2.30. <coughs> Um, propagation. Obviously the slow way to do wisteria is to grow them from cutting the seed. Seed, no matter what species it is, you're going to be waiting forever for the mature hormones to kick in to the flower. So forget seed. Almost forget cuttings unless there's no other way that you can do it. Some people find wisteria cuttings easy. Koroshoffs used to say that you set them all up and you water them every time you walk past. Every time you walk past. The only time I've ever been successful with cuttings, so the <coughs> small cuttings, was when um, it rained solidly for about three weeks at our place, and that was 15 years ago or something, and then all these roots came out. Forget cuttings. Uh, layers are very easy to do. Um, as I said, that one that was up there a minute ago would be reverse taper. That was a layer only two years ago. You don't have to wait forever. If you know anybody who has a mature wisteria plant, that one was done at the same time only two years ago and there wasn't a branch on it. Again, I had the sun burning on there and killed off parts of the trunk at the top there. Kind of went the age a little bit, well, that's what I told us all the way. But that was an interesting twist in, the, in one of the uh, trunks. So, <coughs> I've got time, I'll do a little thing later on Ariel. Aerial layers, grafting of shoots and or roots as well, if you're interested if you've got time. I'm going to hurry up and do this and speed talking. So layers are a great way, or division, if you know someone with an old plant that they don't want and they want to dig it up, great. Uh, dig it up, you can't kill them if they've got root material. If they've got roots, you cannot, well, you can. There's some homeless people on this earth. Um, you, it's very hard to kill them. What I do is put an aerial layer on uh, during the summertime. I'll explain how I do that in a minute. 
but don't take it off until the plant is absolutely totally dormant and probably the best time would be sometime during late July, early August. Same as everything with bonsai, just before the shooting of the new shoots and the sap starts to flow. Making sure that your bag or pot or whatever is full of roots and is going to be able to support this, this, uh, this thing. Now, it doesn't have to be full of roots either. If any root material at all there will uh, keep going. <coughs> as I said, grafting is great if you've already got you know, too many purple ones, as you can do, of course. And if you've got too many purple ones, you can graft white onto it. I've even had an old Japanese. That one down there was actually a, a white sinensis that wouldn't flower, and I grafted Jacko onto it, or Jaco onto it, years ago. I also had a very twisty one at home that someone gave me, which was Japanese wisteria, and uh, who knows what colour it could better flower. So I grafted purple onto it as well, so it won't be ready for a display or even for another year or two. Um, okay, so grafting was great. Now you can also do, um, instead of doing aerial layers, uh, and it hoping that the plant gets its own roots, you can also do a root graft on the part of the plant that you want to layer. Um, but I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. It just gets you roots on the plant a lot faster. Uh, collecting mature ones is obviously the best way because you're going to get nice thick trunks and the, the branches and foliage are going to come fairly quickly after that. If you're expecting to do left, right, back and foliage pads with wisteria, forget it. Because the only time they're worth looking at is during the two or three weeks of, of uh, spring flowering. And then after that, it's just a, a tree with a whole lot of foliage to be maintained. Okay. Care. Now, this is the other mistake a lot of people I've found make. And that is, um, they keep them in the shade house, which is underneath a jacaranda or a poinciana as well. So there's next to no light coming through. Uh, full sun, I tend to overpop them, as I said, because during the summertime they're voracious water drinkers. They, they will suck up as much water as you put in there. So all of these pots in about another month will go into flat plastic sources, which have got about that much water in it. So when you water them, that fills up, and the next day it just empties. So plenty of water is the, is the key to it. Um, I tend to keep them in larger pots. It's hard getting nice bonsai pots for things this size without costing a fortune. So we went to Corolla Markets and got a few of these ones we got for the small. Black pot for the white flowers, green pot for the purple flowers, the old pot at the end, we already had that. So up until um, <coughs> six months ago or something, a lot of them were just in black plastic tubs because our show every year is in November. Yeah. <coughs> no point bringing them in in November. <coughs> okay. Uh, I've got a few notes here, a bit of rain's going. The water tray. Pests and diseases, they're relatively disease free. The only three pests I've ever had on wisterias are uh, grasshoppers like to eat the leaves, which is just a cosmetic thing unless they totally denude it. There's a little thing called a leaf cutter bee. I don't know if any of you heard of those. They do a circular cut out of each leaf and they take that off and tuck it down a hole somewhere and you feed a wasp or a bug or something, you know what they do, but they feed it on something that they can be a problem. And the only other thing that I've had with wisteria as far as pests go is curl grubs in the pot, which you don't really know is happening unless you're doing a regular drenching of malathol or something like that, you know, you don't know the there, you just wonder why the tree's not doing well, we don't stop leaning on that. <laughs> Um, so curl grubs in there will constantly eat the roots back and churn the soil up, which isn't good, but it's still perfectly a tool. So I don't get any other diseases. Shaping with wisterias, um, I do that after it's finished flowering, at the, especially on the top, top parts there, at the base of every flower stalk, there's about five or six dormant growths that will spurt into leaves. If it's not a vigorous stem, that whole flower stalk will just atrophy and drop off. But if it's a vigorous stem, see that one happening there already? Mm -hmm. That's because for some reason this didn't fully fulfill itself in a flower and it's starting to shoot. So I do the shaping basically. <coughs> in winter, I cut out crossing over branches that are really crossing over and pretty bad. Um, and any dead bits in winter where you can see them, 
But once that's gone and this shoots into three or four, I usually only keep two facing the outside of the tree or as with other body type techniques, you keep, keep one facing the direction where you might want it to go, like, you know, these could come down out here a bit further or lie them down and kid some more stuff out here. Um, so shaping is just normal bonsai stuff, but, you know, don't try and throw those pads. Um, mainly because of the, the um, compound leaf structure. I'll just do something here for a minute. If you're not sure what this theory you have, you can, the easiest way to tell, <coughs> two ways to tell, is by the leaf count of the whole leaf. So, That is a whole leaf. Okay, we've got one this one. That is a whole leaf. These are leaflets. It's called a um, pinnate leaf. So the chime. You don't just do a, a count of one leaf. You go over the tree and count several leaves. The Chinese will have between, uh, usually nine to thirteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <coughs> nine to thirteen. And just to complicate things, the Japanese will have, if they're growing well, Anywhere from 13 to 17. 13 to 17 leaflets. That's probably the easiest way to tell. After all, you can just look at the plant not in flower and tell because the, the Japanese ones like, look a lot more extended and long. The other one is the Chinese has bronze new foliage. It's just hard one. It's so <laughs> Bronze new foliage and the Japanese is green. They're the easiest way. There's also um, a method where, I forget which way it is, but the Japanese grows clockwise with its tendrils and the Japanese and the other one grows anti-clockwise. But you sort of got to look from above and then pick it over a little bit clockwise or anti-clockwise. You know. They're the two easiest ways to tell um, which ones they are. Fertilizer. Now, as I was going to say before, um, you'll get conflicting ideas of that <coughs> from people how to grow bonsai and how to grow the steer and how to get them to flower. Some of the stuff that I've read, they say keep them pot bound and starved. Other ones say keep them wet and this, that, and the other. And then others have said, oh, they love a clay soil. Well, I've tried them in clay or clay soil and they drop dead. So I can only tell you what works for me in this climate down here. Fertilizer I am very haphazard with. The potting mix that I put them into, <coughs> you can put them in virtually anything that's well drained. Even though you're keeping it wet, maybe you have to have the drainage in the top half of the thing, right? Not be saturated down here with bomb you stink it, but the rest of it up there is, you know, that's why you only have shallow sources of water, not water up here on the swamp side. So, um, I basically just use the Searles general potting mix with about a third of a rocket cow manure, a third sand, and if I can be bothered, I throw a handful of lobster coat in there. Now, during the growing season, they will grow like anything, lots of tendrils growing everything. You can fertilise if you want to. I would tend to use a um, a, a complete fertiliser will up until about Christmas or January and then swap over, if you can be bothered, swap over to a more high phosphorus potassium to encourage more dormant flower buds to set for the following year. Now, having said that, you know you're going to get a fairly good um, flowering season the following year if in midsummer you're trimming stuff back, because these tendrils can get done way up and you know, way up. If you're trimming back and then suddenly you'll get some flower buds come out, but they won't be tight and compact. They'll be long, very long and stretched because it's in full vigorous growth, not this just coming out of dormancy growth. So 
so it'll be long. They are next year's dormant flowers that are being pushed ahead of time because you've turned it back. Normally they would stay dormant had you not turned it back. So when you see that, you think, right, there's a lot of dormant buds there, going to be good for next year. Um, styles, obviously they're not suited to Arme or <laughs> whatever, except that little one that doesn't flower. Um, basically, informal upright, semi cascade, cascade, weeping. Can't see them lending themselves to anything else much, root plantings or windswept or anything like that. Basically, those four or five styles uh, we do it. Uh, the flowers do give you the weeping effect, but there's something I've been fiddling with a little bit late, of late, and I'll say in the gosh here. That is the weeping style. Not that that's particularly good example, but not a few flowers I've Sorry? Um, as that was growing, as I said, that was the ordinary Listeria sinensis album, which didn't flower, so it was grafted there about five years ago, whatever. So all that's just in five years. All of these I just let grow. They were growing straight up. Now I've learned being a lot less of myself this year, in that I didn't wire these down, because if you try and wire them down while they're growing, they're just going to try and curl back up to themselves and get up. So I let them go straight up. Um, I only wired them down maybe three or four weeks ago as the tree was just starting to plant. Now, I think what might have happened here is, you'll notice on the ends, it's not as many flower buds as there are up here. So I've either, even though I did it very carefully, I've either cut down the sap flow a little bit by bending it like that, or the mere fact of bending it has uh, transfer the vigour of the tree to all of these up here and not those. So I don't quite know how to get around that one. But once these flowers are out and all hanging, uh, it could be quite nice as a little style as well. But to get around that, I don't quite know what to do here. Yeah, I'd probably cut most of these back up if he's playing anyway, then these will send out more numbers you know, to go up. Um, let them go again and maybe just weigh them down while they're growing. I'll give that a go. See if it works. There's more. It's also a very hard style of transport. Now, if you get the right wisteria, it doesn't matter how small they are. That's a wisteria sinensis. Was a just a ground sucker that came up um, last year or something. I dug it out from the big wisteria we had. It's got several flower buds already. So it's getting the right species is not a paramount, or the right types of species is not a paramount thing. Um, yeah, um, I'd really like to, like for this one, for instance, grow some long on that and have them hanging there even further. Anyone have any questions about anything so far? Do you do I trim them? Yes. When they get really unruly and out of, you know, start to climb up all the plants. And... Yeah. They um, grow very vigorously, usually up to only about January, February, something like that. But if they fertilise a lot, they'll keep on going. Um, as I said, I'm very slack with the fertiliser. And they're lucky to get done two, three times during the growing season if that. You know, so having a good soil mix. This one hasn't been repotted for about three years. The others there were all done this year. And there's a couple more at home that haven't been done uh, for a couple of years either. So they don't need repotting every year. They're quite happy with being pot bound. Um, main thing is the water and full sunshine. They will not flower unless they're making heaps of sugars in the leaves. Um, generally the growing period and so on. So repot after flowering? No, I repot just before flowering. If you're going to do it at all, you're better off doing it while it's dormant before the flower buds even start. Like I know, I know where I am, they're going to start about um, early August. Early August, I'll set them start, but even a little bit before that, because sure as things, if you're wiring and doing stuff right, you're going to knock flower buds off. Whereas if they're tiny little dormant, hard things, you're not going to knock them off. So at the end of winter, <coughs> before they, because they're dormant, the roots. Rip trimming, it's only, I've never ever had that situation where wisteria roots are going round and round and round and pop on the feed. You know, they always, 
and fat chubby little sort of roots. They've got little nodules on them, which are nitrogen fixing nodules. Being the legume, the legumes plant. So they never seem to get that really vigorous root um, system in pots. In the ground, they certainly do. They go forever and come up all over the place. Um, yeah, anything other questions? So, when you're root pretty, how, with the curve in pot, yeah. what trouble do you have getting it out of the pot? If there's any trouble, you get something in there and just reef it out or yeah. cut around. Or, yeah, you know, okay. yeah, they're not the best shape for getting yeah. it out of the pot, that's for sure. Oh, well, there's not too bad. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, the, the roots, and virtually being a deciduous tree or plant, mm. um, you can virtually hose every bit of soil off the roots if yeah. you want to and just have it taken bare root. And I don't, there's always a little core in the middle, yeah. and that way it gives you the whole root system to refresh with fresh, fresh mix. Mm. Refresh with mix. Um, okay, now what I'm going to do. Oh, can pass. Just one more. Have you tried them in diamite? Diamite? Yeah. No. I haven't tried anything in Diana. No. I'll, I'll put it this way. When I was starting bonsai at the age of 12, we've all heard of Dr. Koroshoff and, yeah. and um, Vita and his two daughters. Um, down there, there was no information available. There was just nothing. There was the old woman's weekly pamphlet that came out with a few scabby things in it that just all got. Mum got the woman's weekly one. So there's that, and the only way to find out anything was through Koroshoff's little newsletter. Their system then was a bonsai mix should be three elements. It should be a good garden loam or a good potting mix. A third compost, which relates to humus, old cow manure, whatever, your own leaf litter or whatever, and a third coarse river sand. Now you can Structure that for whatever you want. For pines, you'd add more sand, have half sand. For junipers, you'd keep the basic mix. For fruiting and flowering things, you'd add more compost or more cow manure. And of course, you could also uh, fertilise with um, uh, osmocote or something like that, slow release at the same time. I've always, and you may think I'm a dinosaur for saying this, but I've always thought if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If that works for you and you get good results with what you're doing, you know, you can spend, I hope there's no one in the bonds, I know she's selling this stuff, <laughs> but if you're, um, go by what the internet tells you, you can spend an absolute fortune on different soils from Japan and Akadama, you know, like, yeah, that, and different fertilisers and all this, and you can spend a fortune on all of these things, but in my opinion, I don't get into it. And I don't particularly want to at this stage of my life, um, do all that. And, Diatomite, well, you know what it is, don't you? Yeah. It's just the little shells of a diatom, which is a unicellular algae that's found in the ocean. How they harvest it, I don't know, but it's usually used for um, uh, swimming pool filters. Diatomaceous earth. Yeah, diatomaceous earth. Yeah, diatomaceous earth. Um, and, but it's used for them anyway. People used to come into the nursery while I was and buy it, because it was a swimming pool centre as well. And um, so I said, well, what are you using it for? They were using it for keeping fleas from under the house. They use it for in bird keeping to get rid of internal parasites. Now to me, a lot of that stuff is just like almost witchcraft. But anyway, you might have great results with diatomaceous earth or diatoms or whatever, but I've never used it. Sorry about that. <laughs> Any other questions on it? sort of grafting you do? What sort of grafting? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Here we go. Um, this is my, obviously, my wisteria. There's three things here. This is just my experiment tree that I use sometimes. That there was a demonstration of a um, aerial layer a couple of years ago or whatever, so all the roots came out and you would have cut that off the ground and it was another tree. Um, <coughs> the grafting that I use. Get the road across the way. Right. Everything will be turned up today, you don't need it. Now, this can be for uh, root grafting or. Now, here's what we need. Who's got the reading glasses I can borrow? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, they, they just want ones or twos or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Last thing I did with the computer was I put them in the pocket and then take the computer and then thank you very so much. I'm going to make sure the suit can play a bit. Oh, I can see it. Oh, you can do that. For all the stereos, and almost with anything really, this is not just specifically for stereos. Uh, to try and graft onto old woody trunks is virtually impossible. Reason being that the cambium layer just under the surface of the, um, of the bark, which is the active growing part of the bark, if you're familiar with the cambium layer, um, is too thin. It's very narrow in old woody trees. So just say that this was an old trunk I wanted to use and it was all purple. Um, I'd cut it off there allow it to grow a really good, young, strong, vigorous shoot. And that's the best thing that you can graft onto. So what I would do, just pretend this is wisteria. A couple of leaves off, you'll be able to pretend it is. Um, what I would do... No, 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 no. Okay, so we'll leave the long shoot on of the wisteria because it's actively growing. What I would do, I need a, a sign or that it's going to be graft onto. You don't have to do a lot of late bleed and pretending you do. do it short time. Okay. That's a, this is a purple wisteria. That is a white one or something that I want to graft onto. Okay, so what I would do is, first of all, just sharpen that without cutting your finger, hopefully. That's why I need the glasses. Sharpen that to a wedge. <coughs> Very thin wedge. Don't let it dry out. Don't go out and cup of tea for an hour or anything like that. Then just come straight down the side like that. I don't know if the camera's picking that up. A flap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you doing a flap over there? Or not? Yeah. 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 That's good. Uh, Still got the cure around mm -hmm. the fingers there. Do a flap. You'd mostly be familiar with grafting tape or budding tape. What I want to do is I look to see mm, the buds, the dormant buds, where do I want it to go? So do I want the dormant bud to head out away from there or where do I want it? Doesn't matter. You just <coughs> <coughs> the flap's too long for the sign, so I'll just make the sign because the more cambium layer that you can get in contact <coughs> with that flap on both sides, the better. Okay. Can you yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's there like that. I'll turn it around so it fits better that way. No, it doesn't. Figs are very easy because they're, um, they've got very um, um, sappy, sappy growth. The latex, latex type stuff. So holding it there, just tie it on as tightly as it will grow. Two, two ways we can do this. I can either come back down there and tie it off, or if it's a if it's a one where I'm just going to leave this here as is and not do what I'm going to do in a minute, I can do a mummy graft, which is obviously done up like a mummy, twisting of course. Leaving the dormant bud exposed to the air. I can do that and then tie it off, bring it back down, tie it off, leaving the dormant bud there. That stops that little <coughs> cutting sign on piece from dehydrating and drying out. What I prefer to do if I really wanted to get going and do what I wanted to do is bring that back down. It's poor old tree, it's experimenting on so much. Tie it off. Cut it off. Now, what you do, just ordinary old glad bags or whatever, again,
Now at this time the flat's going up instead of down. Sharp on that again. And this is a great way for things that you want to, and it can work with a lot of different things, but obviously things that are snappy like figs. Um, what else? Cacti are very easy. This is so succulent. I've grafted figs, azaleas, crape myrtle. Well, on the subject, being very familiar with the, oh, crape myrtle, I think I might say. Um, Swamp cypress, numerous other ones. Yes. Um, does anybody know the crepe myrtle that is actually a ground colour? Mm. It's a ground colour. It gets big bunches of reddish pink flowers. Chickasaw. Oh, sorry. Chickasaw thing. A chickasaw. What? Chickasaw. Yeah, that's what they call one of them. Oh, it's a tiny okay. little thing about. Nah, this grows vigorously. And as a ground cover, plant it in the ground, yeah. it'll just go sideways. Raise up slightly, it goes sideways with big bunches of pinkish red flowers. Graft a few of those yeah. as cascade ones. It's one we can't cover the actual cover by the but you probably find it on the internet. And also the swamp cypress, one of the biggest problems I find with swamp cypress is that the growth fighting that upward growth. Um, the, Sure, some of you have swap swap cycles. Anyone heard of the weeping one? Look it up. That's called um, Cascade Falls. I was on a, I was actually on I was bonsai seven years ago, and this guy was displaying his twig in a pot. He was, he was displaying his twig in a pot you know, with other stuff, and in the background there was a standard plant about that high with all these weeping branches. That were just starting to come out, and I thought, is that a weeping gravillion or what is it? So I messaged them and asked, what? Forget your bones, I was <laughs> in the background, you know. Anyway, he said it's a, um, a swamp cypress named um, Cascade Falls. Cascade Falls, yeah. Cascade Falls, I keep getting that mixed up with um, the wisteria I was talking about before. What was that called? Amethyst <laughs> Falls. Um, so anyway, track down to Fleming's Nursery down in um, Victoria, who only supplied one people up here, and that was Coronio's Nursery up at Toowoomba. So off we hike, off to Toowoomba. And um, managed to get a you know, five, six foot tall grafted specimen. Got the eyes fixed and things won't work anymore. That's all. Um, managed to get one and I used that for grafting onto some old swamp cypress uh, stumps that I had onto a branch. It's an amazing plant. I just think it's got the ability to look like a, uh, like a weeping willow type bonsai, which you can't do up here. The weeping willows just die off and die back and all that. But this plant comes out of all new branches. Instead of heading up, they just come up and then just head straight down. And then you can trim them over a couple of years where one comes up, so you trim that off in the winter, yeah. then you get another one and then another one. So you can trim it so that you've got this arching sort yeah. of effect with lots of hanging branches that when they first come out in spring, just look like we will below. A bit till you get close. They're just really beautiful. Um, they're very enthusiastic about that one. Now with that one, I don't really have to put much around there. What I could do with that is either tie a pot of ordinary pine soil, you don't have to worry about snake and moss as you would with an um, area layer, uh, a pot of um, soil, just bonsai mix or whatever, and that hopefully should start to do its thing, send and double heal up. So then, what I can do then if it's a wisteria or something else that I'm taking an area layer from, I can then cut that off once that you think that this is growing. You can probably even cut it off beforehand and it's dormant and just pot it. Um, but once you think it's growing, you can cut it off and pot it. Where it really comes in handy and has done for me is creating uh, banyan fig trees. You know anyone familiar with banyans? Mm -hmm. yeah. Big arching leaves with all the aerial roots coming down there. You can get the banyan figs to get their own aerial roots and put straws and cylinders and get them to come down. <coughs> but if you can find some aerial roots to actually graft onto them, that's the main thing. Um, the main thing is that you get the right way out. 
you know, like on a side branch, you don't go drafting it that way because it's just against the sap flow. Oh, I guess it's half moon time, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 